Hey there, stackers. Well, in the United States today, it is Memorial Day, and you're going to hear on today's episode us use the phrase happy Memorial Day. If you don't know what Memorial Day is about in the United States, it's a holiday where we remember and honor people who have died while serving the United States Armed Forces. And so really, when we think of Memorial Day, a lot of the time, we don't think happy Memorial Day. We think about courageous people in trying times. And in the past, we've always had shows where we talked about Memorial Day in a more solemn way. But this year we decided to say happy Memorial Day. My dad's best friend, Jim, who served in Vietnam and just passed away largely from complications of Agent Orange from his time in the Marines. While he didn't pass away in battle, he's a guy I think we can agree, passed away because of the battles that he fought. And thinking about Jim, And thinking about some of my friends who did pass away in battle that I went to school with at the Citadel. I think today we're going to do it a little differently. Today we are going to talk about a celebration. And hopefully you make it to a cemetery today or you learn more about some of the people who've died while serving in the armed forces. But I know Jim then, after that moment, would want us to go find a park have a hot dog, enjoy the day off while remembering him because that's who Jim was. So in honor of all those people today, happy Memorial Day. Let's get on with the show. Hi, I'm Derek. And when I'm not working on the hook for Joe's mom's next greatest rap album, I'm stacking Benjamins, baby. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and happy Memorial Day, friends. Or if you're uh, in one of the other 47 countries outside the USA where people listen to us, uh, happy Monday. Or, uh, you know, I guess it could be Tuesday or something. Hey, either way, we got a great show because today we'll remember a great man in the financial space. We'll learn about T. Rowe Price from biographer and former T. Rowe Price Growth Fund President Cornelius Bond. Plus, in our headline segment, while you're talking picnics and frisbees, we'll be all over IPOs and graduations. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky listener and still leave time for my holiday-themed trivia. And now, two guys who always show up at the cookout empty-handed, it's Joe and oh, j j j j g You didn't show up empty-handed. You brought coleslaw. <laughs> the joke that will never die. <laughs> I was like, I got this one. I saw you leaning forward on the microphone. I'm like, where's this going to go? Where? <laughs> he never starts talking first. Yes. Happy Memorial Day, everybody. Or as we call it here locally, happy food poisoning day. I'm Joe Salsi. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And across the card table from me, celebrating Memorial Day as well. My buddy OG. What is shaking? How many hot dogs did you eat today? I have been saving myself for a little bit later, but I generally clock in at three. Three? Three. Huh. Over the whole day? Over the whole day. That's it. What do you eat for lunch? Um, I was telling my kids about how when I was when I was a kid, I had a friend who had a pool, so during the summer... It would just rotate between the eight of us that would go to his house every day, whose job it was that day to bring the 20 pack of hot dogs, the 20 pack of buns <laughs> so and the ketchup and pickles. And like literally the whole day we would swim and eat and just grill hot dogs. It was awesome. And when you're done with that, you know what you do next? You've our friend Angelo from MetPro come over because thanks to MetPro for supporting. You'd have to do it. <laughs> you, you would have to have some MetPro after that. Thanks to MetPro for supporting Stacky Benjamins for a complimentary metabolic profiling assessment at a 30-minute consultation with the MetPro expert. Go to metpro.co slash SB. You know how they have those Snapchat filters that are hot dogs? You don't even have to 
use the Snapchat filter when all you eat is a hot dog. You look like a hot dog. That's it. When you take your pictures and send them to MetPro. I can see Angelo and his team going, uh, OG. Sir, have you been eating hot dogs? You're like, only hot dogs, as a matter of fact. How did you know? It looks like, like you smell like hot dog water. Your makeup is 85% meat, of which we do not know the origin. The other 15% is unknown. <laughs> it's from Latvia. Thanks also. <laughs> Thanks also to those specific. Thanks also to Experian Boost for supporting Stacky Benjamins. Experian Boost, this is awesome. They can potentially help you establish or increase your access to credit. Boost your FICO score instantly for free. Boost is only available at Experian.com slash SB. Dude, we'll help you lose weight, get in shape, and help your credit score. What else do you want us to do? Doesn't get better than that. I'll tell you what we're going to do. On a Memorial Day, I thought it'd be fun to talk about some of the the greats, OG, in the financial space. And here's one, T. Rowe Price. And if you're not familiar with T. Rowe Price, a big financial organization, historically a very well-run financial organization, happy to talk to Neil Bond about T. Rowe Price. Just a wonderful man who I know we'll have a fantastic conversation with. But first, we got some headlines. So let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins Headlines. You know, Doug jokes around a lot before you get to our headlines, OG, but we we are listened to, and this is a great day to talk about this, in 48 different countries. How cool is that? Very cool. It is is amazing where people will listen to shows about nothing. This isn't about nothing, though. This comes to us from Yahoo Finance. You know, we're in the middle of graduation season, OG, and I thought that this would be appropriate. Employers say this is the most annoying characteristic of new grads. This is written by Alyssa Pry and Janine Ahn. What do you think the most annoying characteristic of new grads would be? Uh, That they know everything or think they do. A new pack of college grads, the piece says, are gearing up to enter the job market. This year, 1.9 million people will graduate with a bachelor's degree, and another 1 million will graduate with a master's or doctorate degree, according to the National Center for Education Statistics. It's funny because it doesn't even talk about a high school graduations either going on or coming soon. Employers plan to hire 17% more graduates than in previous years, and with the unemployment rate at 3.6%, it's a great time to enter the job market. According to LinkedIn, Amazon... Ernst & Young, PricewaterhouseCooper, Deloitte, and Lockheed Martin plan to hire the most new grads this year. Graduates are flocking toward professions like software engineers, registered nurse, salespeople, teachers, and accountants, according to LinkedIn. It's important to have your resume ready and your interview skills polished as you start the application process. It typically takes five months to find a job, according to a study by Randstat Recruiting. But once you secure a position... It's important to prepare for the professional world by keeping your expectations in check, says Paul Wolf, Senior Vice President at Indeed. Quote, patience is the one word I would tell new grads to think about and remember, Wolf says. You're not going to know everything walking in the door, especially if you've just graduated college. Really be a sponge and ask tons of questions, but be careful of how enthusiastic you may be to impress. I was going to say, be careful not to ask too many questions Yes, because you don't want to be that guy. According to job training agency, Wolf Leaders Academy, employers find over eagerness the most annoying characteristic of new grads. Isn't that bad though? I mean, people come in, they're excited, they're pumped, they want to show they're a part of a team and everybody's like, <laughs> back off, cowboy. No, dude, this totally sucks. Dial back the enthusiasm. <laughs> This is you've got 52 years of doing this work. (laughs) Trust me. (laughs) It sucks. This is just can I draw the blood? Can I draw the blood? Can I draw the blood? No, you cannot draw the blood. You just graduated. You work your way up to drawing the blood. And trust me, it's as awesome as you could possibly imagine. How come I don't get to meet with the single greatest client in the firm's repertoire? (laughs) Because Dr. Smith does not care about first year interns. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I, you do have to be aware of, I was going to say, but you do have to be aware of like culture, right? Like you, sure. if the demeanor that your people are giving off is, oh, this sucks. This guy's too enthusiastic. Like that's going to rub off really quickly. And, and, you know, like you said, if you've got new, new blood coming in and they're rip roaring ready to go. Yeah, they don't know everything, but they do know a lot of current stuff and they probably know the fastest way to do the thing that you're doing from a technology standpoint and that sort of thing, or at least the cutting edge way may not be the fastest. But uh, 
you really want to embrace that. Yeah, I agree. I think it's really important for new employees to come in like a new CEO would come in. Listen first, figure out a little bit about what the culture's like, and then jump in with both feet. Like I, I think if you jump in three weeks into your job, looks way, way, way better than being the guy who knows everything on your first day. Be sure to show up on time. That, that That's a big one. You think it's something that you don't even have to bring up, but... I had a friend who was interviewing people and he asked the guy who was late for his interview. He said, I saw you were late for interview. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. I got stuck in traffic. He said, just a question. We'll start off the interview. What do you think at our company, the acceptable amount of days to be late are? The guy goes, per what time frame? <laughs> And my buddy Carter says, <laughs> says, uh, any time frame you want, buddy, you give me the number. He just said in a year, guy said, I don't know, nine. First question, you're done. <laughs> also, um, there's the door. Yeah. <laughs> they go on. That's if, awesome. if you hate your first job, it's probably best to tough it out for the first year before moving on. Wolf says, If you're at a job that's not a good fit, explore what's working and what's not at your current position. That's because of the fact, man, if you leave your first job after six months, it's going to be difficult to get that second chance. Shows up on a resume. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to discern what it is you don't like about it, Wolf says. Really find what gets you excited, what you're passionate about, and that may take multiple jobs to get into that groove. Remember, your first job won't dictate the rest of your career. Gen Z grads will switch jobs four times in the first 10 years after college. And those 25 to 34 year olds stay at jobs an average of 2.8 years. They got job ADD. Mm-hmm. That's an exciting time, though, isn't it? First job. First job, know how your benefits work, talk to HR latch on. It frustrates me so much when you see somebody who's brand new at a great job with a good 401k. They don't even know how that works. They have an employee stock purchase plan or they can buy cheap life insurance through work or whatever it might be. And there's no better time to put that stuff in place because if you're coming right from school, you know, you made eight bucks an hour at the gym, get, you know, being a ticket guy or something like that for the stadium for the last four years. And now you're making $60,000 as an accountant or an engineer or whatever, you know, now's the time to save 30 of that thousand because you'll never know the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Great idea. Saving half your income right away. Our second headline comes to us from Market Watch. It's been a while since uh, Uber's IPO. So I thought we would look back at the early days of Uber, which were, uh, it's been what? great. It's been two weeks now. Uber's IPO was, according to Mark DeCamber here, the fifth worst over the past quarter century by this measure. Bam. Mm-hmm. Uber Technologies, one of the most hotly anticipated IPOs of 2019, produced an unusually woeful stock performance for a company of its magnitude. By at least one measure, the initial public offering was the fifth weakest one-day return of a company with a value of at least $10 billion in the past 24 years, according to data from Dialogic. Uber's stock finished uh, two weeks ago on Friday, the day that it started, off 7.6% giving it a valuation of $69.71 billion, according to FactSet data, after pricing its shares the day before its official public debut at 45. The company's stock on Monday in its second day of trading was down 7.1%, off about 14 from its initial pricing. The first day skid puts Uber's return better than only four other companies sized at least $10 billion. ADT, which raised about $1.5 billion on January of 2018, but booked a first day slide of 11 and a half. U.S. listed shares of Chinese company IQIYU Inc. Mm. Describe as the Netflix <laughs> was, of China. That was hotly contested, I remember. Yes. <laughs> Oversubscribed. Which saw its shares close down 13.6%. And then on that list are Ally Financial, but also on that list, OG, is Facebook, which, as you know, came back uh, really strong later after the IPO. Mm-hmm. This, this is, uh, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. This is the reason why this whole fear of missing out, which I think should be FOMO, not FOMO. It should be fear of messing up your money. <laughs> well, and the people who make money in IPOs, again, for the 9,000th time, are not the people who buy it the day that the stock goes public. They're the people who bought it seven years ago when they put in $800,000 into a struggling startup. 
those are the people that made the money. The people who were investors number six, seven, and eight made all the money. The em- employee number one through 20, those guys made a ton of money. They don't care what the stock price is at $80 or 60 bucks. They don't care because their money is in at 68 cents after being diluted for other uh, other shares and stuff. So yeah, maybe in 10 years from now, we'll look back and see Uber being a part of the Facebook and Netflix and all these companies that are doing really well. Or maybe we won't. But there's no way to know. And certainly if you bought, if you buy IPOs the day they come out thinking, this is how I'm going to... I mean, gosh, I wouldn't even use it for sandbox money. Like that just... Yeah. It just seems like a guaranteed way to get your face kicked in. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of better things to do. Like, you know, I like like the Phil Town stuff, you know, where, where you like look at a company that has some history and has, and more specifically, has earnings and it, to me, it just seems really funky to invest in an organization that doesn't make money. I don't well, care what the what the prognosis is on it. It just seems really frustrating. That's what I think. If you're going to play that game, you have only a finite amount of money. Why not? Why not put that money into something that has a track record and is exciting for for your sandbox money? It has yeah. a track record and it's exciting versus something that has no public track record. Right. Right. I mean, nobody would, you know, if your nephew came to you and said, Hey, I've got a new business. I'd love for you to invest your money into the first thing you're going to ask him is what does it do? And how much money do you make? And if he goes, Oh, well, we do this really cool thing and we lose a billion dollars a day. You're going to go, Oh, okay, cool. Uh, count me out, but you can still come to the barbecue (laughs) as long as you don't (laughs) talk to my friends, you know? Yeah. I think you got to be able to get the heartbeat of the company first. I think that's the important thing knowing how to look at not the technical analysis, but the fundamental analysis about what the company's all about. On that note, by the way, OG, before we get to our takeaways from the headlines today, when it comes to getting the heartbeat, any leader of a company gets that success and productivity isn't just about the number of hours in the day. It's about what you do between those hours. And the same goes for your health and wellness. It's not fundamentally about what to eat or how to train, although those are very important pieces. What MetPro is focused on is time management, working smarter and establishing a game plan specific to your goals and lifestyle needs. MetPro has a unique and important point of view on what true net worth means Their experience helping CEOs and industry leaders meet unique challenges provides them with remarkable insight for anyone wanting to see a greater return on investment with their life. I am imagining, by the way, OG, somebody like here on Memorial Day at a park with their device going and they're chowing on a hot dog as they're listening to me talk about MetPro. Tomorrow I'll start after the potato salad. (laughs) What MetPro does, MetPro's team of experts guides you through personalized nutrition and fitness strategies and educates you about how your body responds to macro and micro adjustments to your fitness, your nutrition, your daily routine. Their proprietary science, technology, and techniques have helped thousands of executives and business leaders learn how to optimally manage their health and achieve their associated performance goals, regardless of extensive travel, demanding schedules. They know that you don't have much time. MetPro provides a wealth of knowledge about your metabolism and what methods will work best for your individual health goals. When we first started working with MetPro, I wonder what metabolic profiling was all about. Here it is. It's a process that lets MetPro get a baseline to see exactly how your body's responding against a very specific set of variables. And then their experts are trained to take those results and translate them then to simple action steps for what you should eat, how you should train, and what your strategy will be. Not just a smack easy thing you find on the internet, but something based completely on you. So for a complimentary metabolic profiling assessment and 30-minute consultation with a MetPro expert, head to metpro.co. That's metpro.co. Think about you as a company head, as a leader, metpro.co slash SB. Got to have the slash SB on there for the 30-minute consultation. So I think our takeaways here are number one, while we're talking about heartbeats and metabolism, investing in IPOs with your sandbox money, probably not as good as ones where you know the metabolic profile ahead of time. And then uh, takeaway number two, brand new person at work, maybe uh, ease up on the reins a little, maybe pull back on the reins a little bit before you go in and tell everybody who's worked there 25 years how little they know. How how you're going to do it better.
I'm super excited to interview this gentleman, Cornelius Bond. Mr. Bond likes to be called Neil. Joined T. Rowe Price as a technology analyst and worked closely with Price for nearly 10 years. That front row position gave me a unique view into the mind of the man whose growth stock philosophy has generated above average gains for investors for years. In T. Rowe Price, Bond not only draws on his personal relationship, but also had access to dozens of unpublished corporate and personal documents in writing and knew the right people to talk to to find out exactly what made one of the uh, top people in finance tick. Here to talk about the man, the company, and the investment philosophy that's T. Rowe Price, let's say hi to Neil Bond. And coming down the stairs to the basement, it's our new friend, Neil Bond. How are you, man? I'm just great. Uh, hi, Joe, and thank you for welcoming to the basement. Well, I'm so glad you could be here with us. When did you first meet T. Rowe Price? Because you and you and Mr. Price had a very interesting relationship. Yes, I, we first met in 1960. That's when I left uh, Westinghouse, where I was a uh, managing the manufacturing operations uh, at uh, the Air Arm Division, Westinghouse. He uh, introduced himself for my first interview. What was your first impression of him? He was reserved. He was uh, dressed uh, very properly, uh, suit, uh, coat, uh, vest, tie. Um, He was quite formal in a very uh, sort of older gentlemanly way in those days. He was not given to frivolity, but his questions were extremely insightful, needless to say. Well, well, and it's interesting because, it, as you explained eloquently throughout the book, I mean, him getting to that point is this really long, circuitous journey. Where was T. Rowe Price born? Tell me about that. He was born in Glendon, Maryland, and he was delivered by his father, who was the only physician in town. And he was born in 1898. Was his dad his biggest influence growing up? It's hard to say. He was certainly a very important influence, but in a business sense, I think his grandfather was probably the most uh, influential. His grandfather was a developer in Baltimore County, which was a rapidly emerging county at that time, and invested in land and um, was uh, truly a businessman. Uh, His father spent a great deal of time trying to convince him that uh, the medical profession was uh, the proper route. Yeah, it, well, and it seems like early on, Dad kind of won out. He he went to school, is my understanding, uh, went to school to become a doctor. That's correct. In fact, um, in his high school yearbook, they called him Doc. That was his nickname. So clearly he was headed in that direction at that point in time. It's funny. You say that he's reserved, and yet this picture you paint of him as a young man is not a reserved kid at all, though, Neil. He seemed to be a little outlandish and very popular with the the girls. You're exactly right. Uh, It was a very different Mr. Price. His son later, when I talked to him, said that he felt that Mr. Price, when he went into business, in the investment management business, and you indicated that perhaps you were in that business at one point in time, yeah. he felt that he had to be mature and serious and almost the opposite of what he really was at Swarthmore when he was in college. And as a matter of fact, it made it quite difficult for his son to establish a relationship with him. And it was only as Mr. Price approached his death in the last several years that he opened up that warm side of him that, as you mentioned, was always there, but uh, he didn't show the world. Did you get to see the warm side at all? Every once in a while, I uh, didn't point out or or talk much about having a martini or whatever. I was trying to to make it a little bit more of a serious book, but he, like many in those days, did enjoy his cocktails and we would have these meetings at various clubs around the country where we did our planning. And uh, we would have a nice dinner with wine. And then the um, stingers would come out in, the, in big pitchers. We'd play ping pong. And everybody would totally relax. And you began to see that little smile 
come out and that sense of humor. He had a wonderful sense of humor that he kept hidden most of the time. I want to just uh, dive for just a second into his his childhood, just because, as you explain, a, a grandfather was in real estate. Dad was a doctor. We haven't talked about this, but he went to a private high school. He really had a privileged upbringing, Neil, but he never he never squandered that opportunity. Like you see, there are people that have privileged upbringings. He really made the most of it. He was a he was a pretty good student, wasn't he? Well, if you asked him, he wasn't. But in actual fact, I believe it in his high school, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think some 60% of his class did not finish high school. Hmm. Uh, so Mr. Price was one of the, uh, uh, certainly did. Same way at Swarthmore, he was one of three accepted from his high school to Swarthmore, and yet he was the only one to finish. So I think he was a much better student than he would allude to us. Uh, us ju- he called us juniors. A junior. Those days. Did we were juniors? Uh, did he call everybody at the firm juniors or a bunch no. of people? No, we we had two clear divisions. There were the so-called seniors, two of which he he joined the firm with uh, Walter Kidd, who was my direct boss, head of research, and Charlie Schaefer, who was kind of the head of the counseling in those days. They were clearly seniors, and then they uh, Kirk Miller joined as a senior, and then John Ramsey joined as a senior. And the rest of us were all juniors. We remained so no matter what our age was. It didn't, it, you weren't going to swim across that moat. And it was hard. It was, it was very difficult to swim across, yes. <laughs> well, it's funny how he got to become the T. Rowe Price that we know. I mean, w- w- most people don't know T. Rowe Price the man like you do. Of course, they know the institution. But out of college... Where did he start? Tell me about his early jobs, because this was not as uh, clean a move into money management as I would have expected. No, you're exactly right. In fact, it was one of the most devious, probably. He started out in a plating company in Pennsylvania. He graduated, incidentally, as a chemist from Swarthmore. He never took a business course at Swarthmore. Why didn't he, and not to cut you off, but why didn't he go from chemist then into medicine ultimately? If everybody called him doc and his dad wanted him to be a doctor, where did that path end? Well, I really think he became a chemist. He majored in chemistry because chemistry was an important major if you were going to be a doctor. And I really think that was the reason that he had, that he did do that. In the end, it's... Well, he came out of college uh, and fully intending to be a chemist and to be a great chemist. That was his that was his goal. But once he got to work, particularly in this plating company and uh, as a uh, uh, sort of an older building, and uh, he and his friend from college who came is actually a fraternity mate, they both were kind of secret behind the plating tanks, which is probably one of the smelliest and certainly warmest areas, and this was the summertime that you could be, I think that might have uh, cooled him off a little bit. (laughs) But that only lasted, as I mentioned in the book, about six months. Uh, The great steel strike of that year occurred, and uh, the plant closed. It it ran out of money and and went bankrupt. So so he was laid off. Less than one year at this business, he's laid off. Yes. And then what happens? Well, he thought about it. It was certainly a learning lesson. You want to investigate your employees' finances, in particular their labor relations, before you go to work for them. And he also realized that uh, although it was an interesting company, they certainly weren't going anyplace. So his next uh, job was with DuPont. And it was really like going from night to day. Uh, DuPont was considered to be one of the best companies in the world in those days. It was over 100 years old. It had just given up its uh, gunpowder major product line and was entering the chemistry business. Chemistry was a little bit like uh, the Internet, maybe, to use a sort of a crude analysis of those days. It was where all the new products were coming, where all the technology was investing. You had thin films. You had uh, plastic products. You had all these new chemical products. And so DuPont was growing rapidly. Uh, It was sort of like going to work for IBM if you were a computer. But again, the company, the uh, plant that he went to work for was right on this uh, bog 
It was not too far from uh, New Jersey. I don't know if you've ever driven up the uh, New Jersey Turnpike in the 60s, but there was a strong smell of the pig farms, which would waft over the over the uh, his factory, his plant from time to time. And he began to get interested in Barron's, in the Wall Street Journal, in Fortune magazine. And he found it very difficult to read the chemical text that he was supposed to read. He lasted a little bit longer there. I think it was almost a year when the um, Depression of 1921 happened. And uh, he was laid off, as a, not because he wasn't doing a good job, but because he was the last man hired. So they, they let him go for that reason. When he got back, I think he really began to think about his career. And I suspect his grandfather might have intervened. And he was able to maybe overcome that um, his father's pull a little bit that he should be not in the medical profession, at least in something nearly like the medical profession. He went to work for a uh, brokerage firm. I felt like, but before we get into the brokerage firm, Neil, I felt like with those first two jobs, two jobs within two years, yes, night and day, one firm a little shady and not really great, and then this big, huge firm, I felt like he got like a first-class economics lesson. <laughs> he did. He did. Like, like front row seat there. Yes, exactly. I mean, uh, you're right. The DuPont was obviously the exact opposite. They were extremely profitable, whereas uh, the equipment was uh, probably secondhand. It is uh, old of company. DuPont's was shiny and new. Yeah. 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 I didn't, and, and I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to draw attention to that because next you're going to tell us, I'm sure, about how he learned how the world of financial services can kind of stink too. <laughs> well, yes. He, I guess it was difficult making that transition, and finally he ended up at a uh, sort of a third or fourth rate bro brokerage firm in Baltimore, where his mother had an account, which sort of showed that his mother was important. And certainly she understood that he might not like to be a, become a doctor, so she really did help him quite a bit she, uh, in, in making this transition to the brokerage firm, and he took to it like a duck to water. He it was a nice time to be in the market. The, the bear market was over and there was a bull market just beginning. And he made enough money actually in six months to pay for a nice summer trip to Europe with a friend. The friend has never been defined, but uh, a friend. You know, he must have done pretty well, uh, although a dollar went very far in those days. And he, you know, stayed in some nice places, enjoyed the food and so forth. But that was also one of the of his hobbies that would become very important in the future of his travel and, and seeing the world. But it sounded like from the tone of the book, he really didn't like the buying and selling. He didn't like the fact that the only way these people were going to make money, well, the only way he was going to make money was kind of different than the way his client made money. Exactly. Uh, his, the only way that his boss could see to make money was to trade his client's stock. That was the only way the firm made money was in trading. And yet he quickly saw that that was not in the best interest of the client. And he began to move his clients into the companies that he felt were would fit their portfolio. And then from there, he goes into the world of bonds. So once again, he gets his front row seat to how stock trading works, front row seat then to how the bond market works. Uh he then goes into this big, bigger firm where he finally, it seems like, settles down for a while um, uh, and really had a nice career going there. Well, I might uh, interrupt. Uh, the brokerage firm, he came back from his nice trip to Europe to find that his brokerage firm was in bankruptcy. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so here he had two very quick experiences with bankruptcy. Apparently, they had played the old Ponzi scheme uh, that Madoff typified later when they got they started to not deliver the, the stocks to their clients. And well, people and, go to jail, and the people went to jail. Did they and really they had big fines? And that was his boss, of course. Yeah, not, not, yeah, yeah. He had nothing to do with that. But anyway, that was a, another great learning experience. So, just very briefly, his next firm, just like DuPont, he went to the opposite extreme. He went to work for a bond house, and it was a bond house with very wealthy partners who really didn't have to work. 
and only were in business, I think, to uh, help their clients, uh, help their friends out in a high quality bond portfolio. And again, he began to buy the bonds, not that the firm wanted him to buy, but the ones that were best for his clients. And he he found that the best salesmen actually were his satisfied clients. And he began to rapidly build up his portfolio. He became quite successful at the firm, but he was still interested in equities. That was his uh, first love. But he had, at that point in time, because the firm was successful, he was successful in the firm, he could take enough time and look around to see what company he wanted to work for and pick his own boss. So uh, he went to uh, McCubbin, called uh, Mr. McCubbin, founded this company. It was a, not the biggest company in Baltimore, but it was a very fine company in the bond business and the investment business. He was actually hired in to be in the bond side. He worked directly for Mr. Legg, who Legg and company, of course, survives today, although Mr. Legg is, is uh, long since dead. But Mr. Legg became a very important mentor for him. And um, he spent the next 12, his next 12 years at what became McCubbin Legg and then just John C. Legg. This ended up becoming the Leg Mason uh, mutual fund family. Yes, exactly. Gotcha. The uh, I need to skip ahead, but I do want to talk about one thing specifically, which is T. Rowe Price has had some phenomenal funds as a company, but there are two funds at the beginning that I want to talk about, which is the, obviously the T. Rowe Price Growth Fund and the yes. New Horizons Fund. Can you tell me a little bit about how those funds were developed initially? Uh, Mr. Price developed what he called the growth stock philosophy. And basically, it was due to his being at DuPont, uh, where he learned that the way to make money was not to trade it. The DuPonts made their fortunes from holding through thick and thin shares of common shares of DuPont. Similarly, his friends who worked at DuPont, the ones that made the money were the ones that held DuPont. And DuPont was a rapidly growing company at that point in time, growing faster than the economy. And... As he looked at DuPont, he developed his growth stock philosophy along what made DuPont successful, i.e. a great management, one of the best in the world, fantastic finances, in an industry that was growing far faster than the economy, in a company whose sales were growing far faster than the economy. And he focused on one particular financial detail that actually was very important to DuPont's success, which is return on invested capital. In those days, people just looked at profit margin. But obviously, return on invested capital is the key to the success of any business. So we put those into a format called the growth stock philosophy, which I describe in some detail in the book, and uh, used this to start the growth stock fund, which only invested in growth stocks. The purpose was to analyze companies, not stocks. He didn't feel that trading stocks, as I pointed out in my DuPont example, made any sense. He said he'd never known anybody that made money consistently on trading stocks. But focusing on companies is much more of a common sense approach to investing. What I liked about this, too, was the fact that he knew this from firsthand experience. Yes. He had done (laughs) short-term trading at one point, so he knew in his bones that it didn't work. Very good point, Joe. He he did. And uh, the growth stock fund... In its first 10 years, was the best performing fund in its uh, category, which was the large companies in those days. And he started his, what you mentioned, his second fund, the New Horizons Fund, in 1960, 10 years after he started the Growth Stock Fund. And the New Horizons Fund became the best performing fund, mutual fund, in the United States for its first decade. And actually, I went back and looked, and uh, these funds are still performing extremely well and have consistently beaten the Standard & Poor Index, which seems to be our current measure for the past uh, 10 and 20 years. Is that the so, wrong measurement tool, though? I mean, you see the average investor out there, people listening, always talk about beating the S&P 500. Yes. Is that really relevant? Well, he felt, and I think uh, Buffett actually mentioned the same thing, he felt that if you couldn't at least beat the Dow Jones average in his day, then he didn't deserve to be paid anything. As Buffett said, he'd just still be ringing his cup out on the city square looking for a handout if he couldn't beat the at least beat the Dow Jones average. 
And he always compared his performance in his mutual fund annual report every year to the Dow Jones average. And he'd show you that also over five and 10 years. It's not the best road mark. Yeah. As I said, what he believed was buying and holding great companies for 30 or 40 or 50 years, as he did. It was it was investing in the very best companies in the world. What would he think then about this trend uh, lately, especially since the turn of the century toward uh, much more passive investing? You know, I mean, his approach, as you know, your approach too, <laughs> very passive a lot of the time. But would he buy the whole S and P five hundred index, or want to pick out the companies inside of there that were his favorites? The latter, the latter, of course. Uh, as I said, he would never understand this. He he could not understand how anybody could stay in business in the investment business and not at least beat the Standard and Poor index. Mm -hmm. I mean, to him, that was sort of a threshold. If you couldn't do that, you did really deserve to be in business. And as you may know, in their annual reports, T. Rowe Price today talks about the fact that uh, 80% of their funds have beaten th their LIPR averages. Today, of course, there are over 100 funds and uh, income funds and value funds and so forth. But still, the basic concept of buying the very best companies prevails today. And that's allowed the fund to continue to do pretty well. The book is T. Rowe Price, The Man, the Company, the Investment Philosophy. What a fun read this was. I mean, it was so interesting to see behind what you know. Maybe a lot of maybe people don't know, like the investment philosophy of T. Rowe Price and how so much of this comes from these uh, experiences that he had as an individual over time. So thank you for making this a reality. Where can people get the book, Neil? Uh, it's on sale at Amazon. It's on sale in many stores. I just made sure that it was on sale at the airport in San Francisco and Baltimore. So, uh, so is it wild seeing your book when you go to the airport? It is. It actually is a very nice cover. Mr. Price, of course, is long since dead. And, and having that cover with the little black, I thought they did. Wiley did a wonderful job with that. Yeah, they really did. Well, thanks for spending a few minutes and hanging out with us talking about uh, T. Rowe Price. Thank you, Joe, for having me. Enjoyed it. Happy Memorial Day, everyone. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and welcome to My Trivia. We're at party level five here in mom's basement, and that means mini weenies, chips, dips, salsas, quesos, chilies, and oh, oh geez, just about to do that dance he does whenever he gets two margaritas in him. Oh, that's a hoot. Hey, but don't you worry. We'll, uh, we'll help divert your eyes from OG with today's trivia. How about that? While we've talked about the biggest tourist destination in the USA, we haven't been date specific. So let's do that right now. What is the number one domestic destination for Memorial Day travel? I'll have your answer right after the break. Well, you know that keeping a better credit score makes it easier for you to make sure that if you need a loan, that you'll pay less in interest fees. So the question is, why is it so hard to raise your score? Well, it won't be as hard thanks to Experian. They've launched Experian Boost, a brand new way to instantly increase your credit scores. And get this, guys, it's free. As you know, a higher credit score can help you establish and get access to credit and preferred rates for the things that you might need in life. Experience on a mission to help boost America's credit score, which will help millions of people across the country build and get better access to credit. People all across America have already raised their credit scores with Experian Boost, and you should too. For the first time ever, paying your utilities and your cell phone can instantly improve your credit score. Experian Boost works by giving you credit for the bills you're already paying through your bank account, like your water bill, your gas bill, your electric bill, your cable, your cell phone. And because of that addition, it used to take months to see your credit score rise a point or two, but with Boost, you can increase your credit score instantly. Boost is free to use, only available from Experian. This, by the way, it's the first time a credit bureau is allowing consumers to submit utility and telecom payments to be factored into their credit file, and only Experian's doing that. The only positive payments are going to be factored into their credit file, which means it can only help you. It can't hurt. 
in a rare situation where a person's score would go down from boosting, listen to this, you can instantly disconnect boost and your credit score will go back up to where it was. I haven't seen or heard any stacker yet has uh, talked to me about that happening to them. It's always gone up. Experian Boost can potentially help you establish or increase your access to credit. Boost your FICO score instantly for free. Boost is only available at Experian.com slash SB. That's E-X-P-E-R-I-A-N dot com slash SB. Welcome back, you trivia party hounds. I was under the impression that I was one of the few people in the basement to like those impossible burgers, but I take my eyes off that tray for a couple of minutes to do the trivia, and what do you know? Looks like my most popular destination today is going to be Burger King. Ah, but for you, I bring another treat, your trivia. Before the break, I asked you, what is the number one domestic destination for Memorial Day travel? The answer... Well, if you've been paying any attention to last week's shows, you may have caught this theme. If you said Orlando, Florida, you'd be right. I'm sure this Memorial Day bash is close second, though, right? Hope you can make it over for some mini weenies. See ya. Big thanks again to Neil for hanging out with us. You know, it's funny. John Bogle gets lots of accolades, and rightly so. And Vanguard is a heck of a company. But here's another company, OG, with above average returns for investors, a commitment to keeping costs low, Mm -hmm. all the same stuff. They were kind of cool about keeping costs low before it was cool to keep costs low. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And they're, you know, an actively traded usually, or a lot of their stuff is a little bit more actively traded anyway. And even on their regular run of the mill mutual funds were ahead of the curve in terms of cost structure, you know, 20 years ago. Fascinating company. You can see how they they came about with T. Rowe Price's broad uh, history. Yeah, and I like the story behind the story. Kind of like when you learned about like Sir John Templeton. Right. And you go, wow, that dude is smart. Yeah. Like wicked smart. And that makes a ton of sense why, you know, Franklin, for example, or Franklin Templeton is much more of a value type of shop than T. Rowe Price is. But it makes sense because when you read the stories about him, like that's how he, that's his that's history, how his brain worked. Yeah. Like that's, he was looking for opportunities, you know? So very cool to hear the the background. So there are other fun companies, basically but, what you're saying. Believe it or not, there's not just one. I know I found oh, okay. it surprising too. That's weird. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline, tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. And here on Memorial Day in the United States, we asked our Facebook group, uh, head to, by the way, facebook.com forward slash basement for the link to get there. We asked them what the two most important things were. And our friend Claudia said, Wi-Fi and wine. Hard to beat those two. Yeah, but you can get in some trouble. Like ever do some ever do Amazon shopping after having a glass or two of wine. I've had a, like, and I'll take that, and I'll take that. I did that with some with wine recently. I've oh, had some bad, bad rambly Twitter posts uh, that came you? after Wi Fi no, and wine. Come on, no, no, no. shocking. That's, a, that's not you. Yeah, uh, actually, Haven Life says it's your loved ones and your time, but you can spend more time with your loved ones, telling them exactly you can tolerate more time. <laughs> And it's a little bit of a, or or not, it's a little bit of a truth serum, maybe too. (laughs) If you've got, let me tell you exactly what I think about. (laughs) That's why they've made buying quality term life actually simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash haven now for a free quote. That's stackybenjamins.com forward slash haven now. We talked about Haven Life Plus, all the things you get when you buy policy through Haven Life. So not only is it cost efficient, they also give you extra. It's just such a cool company. Let's say hi to Nick. We're going to throw out the Haven Lifeline to him today. Hey, Nick. Joe and OG, what's going on? First time, long time in the basement here. I'm 32-year-old, maxed out my Roth IRA the last seven years. It's really my only notable retirement fund. I've started contributing to my 401k that my firm offers. They do not match. So this year will be the first year I can't contribute to the Roth because of the income restrictions. So just trying to get your your feel on if the 401k is the best possible way, maybe traditional. Uh, there is some diversification into a, a real estate LLC, but I guess we should take that off the table here. And another quick one. Uh, fundamentally, I disagree with the way 
college prices are going. I have a five and a two year old. Uh, the five twenty nine plans restrictions and limitations to, that it can only be used for college really concerns me, especially because myself, I went to an in state school. I I leveraged community college in the military. And I have no college debt. So what are your thoughts on a UGMA account rather than a 529 plan? I understand the tax impacts are different, but to me, it gives a much greater amount of freedom when the minor turns of age 18 or 21. Love to hear what you guys think. I appreciate it. Hey, Nick, thanks for the question. And uh, happy Memorial Day to you, sir. OG. So the question is, uh, do we want to contribute to the 401k more now because the Roth yeah, that's is the, off the table, basically? That's the first one. To 401k or not to 401k? That is the question. Hmm. So, uh, yes. Sure. Go ahead. Maybe maybe more. <laughs> maybe more to that than maybe, just that. Maybe, maybe slightly, just, yes. Just, well, you know, so, so firstly, if you're making too much money for a Roth, congratulations, because that means that you make some pretty good money. Double check that because, again... Some people mistake your top line income for maxing out the income requirements on the Roth when it's really a kind of a after 401k and there's some add backs and things like that. So you could, you could actually be a little under, even if you're just slightly above when you first look at it. So just, just double check, use a calculation again to make sure that you're under or uh, over, I mean, but assuming that you are. 401k is obviously the 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 next best place. And why not use the Roth 401k if your company offers it? If you weren't contributing the maximum anyway to your 401k and the Roth maximum, then you might be able to do a combination of both and basically recreate exactly what you were doing just in the confines of the 401k plan. Now, I know that there's a little bit less options in terms of your investment choices and that sort of thing, and you know, so be it. But saving money certainly trumps not saving it, even if you have to save it into a crappy place, you know, even if you have, quote unquote, crappy 401k options, I'd rather use those and still be able to retire than not use them because, oh, well, I make too much money. I can't put any money away. Yeah. If you look at the friction that's caused by the tax layout on a non-401k fund versus a 401k fund with reasonable expenses you come out far ahead on the 401k plan, even if it's just generic vanilla. Yeah. And why not contribute to your 401k to drive your income down a whole bunch so that now you have the ability, your taxable income down so that you have the ability to contribute to the Roth. Yeah. If you're close to the line, yeah. You kind of make it. So on the 529 versus, oh, so God, what were you saying? Well, I was going to ask you before we transition over to the 529 play in question for college savings still on retirement, do you think, have you ever seen a 401k plan that was bad enough that you told a client not to use it? No. Yeah, I can't think. I've seen some really bad ones. Really, really, really bad plans. Yeah. But see, here's the thing. If they're really bad at the very beginning, it's because they're brand new. Because there's no such thing as a free lunch. It costs money to do the calculations. It costs money to hire the actuaries. It costs money to have the technology to, you know, have the platform for you to go online and look at your stuff. It costs money. You know, all these things cost money. And sometimes business owners don't want to pay the cost. So they bundle the costs inside of the products that are given to the, to the employees. But that only happens at the very beginning of the plan, because once the plan starts making enough money or, or there's enough money in it, then you can start offsetting some of those costs with lower, lower plan costs because there's just enough money in there. So even the crappy ones eventually will have some sort of come to Jesus meeting, basically. Somebody's going to go, wait a second. Yeah. We're paying you $300,000 a year to do what? And the guy's going to go, oh, geez, sorry. No, I mean, uh, we can knock that down to like $150,000 now, you know, (laughs) a bargain. But, you know, it costs money for all that stuff. Yeah. Put money in your 401k. I don't care how crappy it is. Second question was about 529 plans. Nick doesn't like 529 plans. Asked about the UGMA account. Turns out I don't like UGMA accounts, so I guess we're at an impasse. What are we going to do? Why, now, don't, the, um, why don't you like the UGMA account? Well, it's not that I... Here's the thing. If you're not saving money for your kid for college because you have a different idea of how to make that work, whether it's, hey, we're going to cash flow, we're going to make them do the community college thing if they can't get a full ride for your scholarship to the big in-state school, we're going to really push the military. Like All those are really great options. That's great. 
then don't save for college in any way, shape or form. You know what I mean? Like if you want to give your kids money at 18, okay, fine. That's a different goal. But to say that I'm using this for college, but it's really not for college because I don't think that I need it for college, then it's not a college fund. It's a, I'm going to invest money to give my kid money at age 18. And when you translate that into that phraseology, I think it puts on a new context. It, it colors it a little differently in that, yeah, I'm not going to give my kid a whole bunch of money at age 18. <laughs> like, I'm not going to save a half, a, uh, you know, a quarter of a million dollars or $50,000 or $75,000 or $10,000 for that matter to give my kid at age 18 because that's what an Ugma does. Now, you'd say, my kid will do the right thing or else he can go live on the streets and oh, okay, yeah, 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 all that's true. But when you phrase it correctly, you know, we talk about ask yourself better questions to get better answers. If your question isn't, do you like UGMAs versus 529s? P.S. I don't really think that I'm going to need college savings. Which one's better for college? It's like, well, none of them are better for college because you just said you don't want to use it for college. So they both suck for college. Now, if you said, I want to save money so that when my kid turns 18, I can say, dude, here's 50 grand. Do with it as you please. Whether you want to go to school or you want to, you know, buy a Harley or whatever you want to do, make it happen. Then I think that's a good option. I'm a big fan of making sure your retirement is taken care of and your personal finances are tip top before starting the, the charitable plan of let's figure out a way to give money away. And that is giving money away for college savings, but it's also giving them just plainly giving money away. There's plenty of people out there who I talk to that go, Hey, the cost of, of housing is outrageous. I live in insert metropolitan area here and the cost is really high. I want to be able to help my kids out with the down payment on their house. What do you think? That's a different goal than saving for college. So you would invest it differently, but still under those circumstances, I don't know that I would use an UGMA or an UPMA account because what happens if they marry a pro athlete and they've got a gazillion dollars? They don't need your 50 grand for the, for the uh, down payment. You know what I mean? And now you've got it in an account that you could only give to your kid. You know, and Nick was talking about real estate in one part and he took that off the table, but even depending on where he's at with the real estate based on his kids uh, ages, didn't he say five and two, I think. Yeah. I mean, you look at a, you look at a 15 year mortgage now you've got them 20 and 17. He could buy a piece of real estate and have it paid off by then, uh, rental real estate, and then use the cash flow from that rental property mm -hmm. to then pay for his kid's college himself, but use it if he wants to for that or use it for something else, depending on what they do. I know clients who are heavily entrepreneurial oriented and who have said, I disagree with the whole premise of college. I went to college, but I didn't, you know, enjoy it or I didn't think it was helpful or whatever the case is. And they'll say, you know what? I want to help my kid invest in a business. I don't want to pay for my kid to go to school. I'll pay for my kid to buy a Midas franchise because everybody needs their brakes checked. Or I'll help my kid buy a Jimmy John sub sandwich shop. And that's perfectly fine to do. I don't know that I want to mandate that that has to happen by putting it in something like an UGMA. Yeah, it's all really start off with Start off with your goals and with flexibility, I think, first, Nick. Thanks for the question. We also are finishing off a segment that was the letter segment here. If you want to ask a question of the show, you'll go to the Haven Lifeline, stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And OG and I are happy to uh, answer your question. But we still have a few letters from back in the day. This is a quick one from Jessica. She says, hi, Joe and OG. I have a question. Maybe you can help. I recently sold some stock in my Fidelity account. Can I use the money and gains from selling the stock to fund my Roth IRA? Thanks. By the way, love the show. Well, thanks, Jessica. We love your letter, which is why we're answering it. Um, what do you got, OG? Yeah, absolutely. You can, as long as you have earned income besides that. So if you, or if you're married and you have a spouse that has earned income and it's over $6,000, then this year you can contribute $6,000 to your Roth. Uh, there's the income requirements that we were talking about a few minutes ago, but if you meet those, you can use whatever money you have to fund it in a Roth. In fact, I often will, will tell people who are sitting there with bunches of money in their non-qualified accounts or regular brokerage accounts like, hey, you know, you're not putting money into a Roth right now. Why don't you use this money and at least shelter it from taxes for, uh, I don't know, uh, the rest of eternity and then never have to think about it again. So however you came about the money, if it was buried in the backyard or you found a treasure chest or whatever, like that all counts. Yeah. And when uh, OG says income requirements, it's, it's, what he means by that was 
exactly what we were talking about with Nick, making too much money. So there is a cap on the amount of money you can make. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks for the question, Jessica. Man, we got a couple of great but succinct questions today. Nice job, team. That's going to do it for today. Just two things before we say goodbye. Number one, thanks to everybody who's left a review of this here podcast. And uh, we've had a nice little flood of reviews. This is one mom has on the refrigerator now, OG. It says five stars. This comes from uh, Matt Brown, 025. This one took me a while to get. He said, uh, 65 is passing. <laughs> I got it right away. <laughs> Just a fan. Fans. Basically, how you got through college, dude. That's <laughs> how you should you should you should recognize that phraseology, just as like the old days. <laughs> That's just a fantastic review. I I love it. Thanks, Matt. If you've got if you've got a cryptic one like Matt or more straightforward, whatever. Thanks for telling people. That's a little clue right there about what people are getting into when they listen to Stacking Benjamins. All right, last thing then for today. OG and his team are taking new clients. So if you're looking for good financial help in your corner, use this link, stackybenjamins.com forward slash OG, just the letters OG, and that will take you to their calendar. And that's the first step in the process to talk to OG and his team about how they would interface with you to make your financial plan better. All right, that's going to do it. Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned this Memorial Day? By the way, OG, happy Memorial Day. So, what did we learn today? First, take some advice from T. Rowe Price by way of Cornelius Bond. Mr. Price talked about buying quality stuff while paying attention to cost. That's a true Memorial Day recipe for winning with your investments. Second, starting a new job? Maybe save your uh, I-know-everything-about-how-it's-done approach for after, uh, well, you know, you've seen how the people who've been working hard before you arrived actually got things done. But the big lesson, don't hand Joe's mom a limbo stick. No, no, I said don't. (laughs) Okay, Okay. all right, we're going to see just how low I can go. Special thanks to Cornelius Bond for making a stop by the basement. Looking for Cornelius' book? Order through our Powell's book link in today's show notes at stackingbenjamins.com and you'll be supporting an independent bookseller's as well as your favorite podcast announcer. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter reese and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I just jumped the shark. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. What happens on the after show stays in the after show. And it's funny because from time to time, people will talk about the after show and you know, you're not supposed to. And I love the community that goes and reminds them of that. If you have to talk about it, we have made one concession. You can call it dessert. Outsiders don't know what dessert is. You know, we talk a lot in our Facebook group about podcasts we like and about Netflix that we like. And something I've always liked are indie podcasts. Like one of my favorite podcasts that many of you have heard from me talk about before is Betty in the Sky with a Suitcase. This flight attendant just takes a recorder on an airplane and gets stories from flight attendants about what it really is like sometimes. And uh, the lesson being don't do alcohol and Ambien at the same time is, is really the big one. But I love, I love 
me some indie podcasts. And the more that we have these big names coming out with podcasts, the more I think we should shine a light on some podcasts that don't have a light shine on them as often as they should. So I've been binging on this show. That's a long way of saying I've been binging on the show called what was that like? And, uh, this is, this is, is everything. And and I got to tell you, a, it's not always for kids. And as an example, one of my favorite shows when I first started listening was one talking to a woman who was uh, going to commit suicide by being run over by a train. And uh, the host, Scott Johnson, just really gets in her head about what that was like. I'm not going to play that uh, uh, today, um, but I will play this. This is from a fairly recent episode. And well, I'll show you a little bit of Scott's work. Here we go. On a scale of one to 10, how weird is the feeling of lying down in your own grave? I tell you what, from one to 10, he's at 11. It was the most craziest thing ever when the uh, detectives came up to me and said, you know what? We have one more thing we have to do before we go through this whole case. And he was to put me in a grave with a bullet wound on my head. I just could not believe what I was hearing. That was just, that's just so amazing. And, uh, well, guess what? Hey, look who's walking down the stairs to the basement right now. Unbelievably. It's the creator of one of my new favorite shows, Scott Johnson. How are you, man? Doing great. Hey, Joe. Being on the other end of stories like Ramon's here, Scott, you got to just be sitting there with your mouth open going, I can't believe I'm hearing Ramon talk about faking his own death. It is really weird. I'll tell you when I'm, when I'm really sitting here with my mouth open is when I read about the story online and I contact the person involved and they say, Sure, I'd love to do a podcast interview. Yeah, like that's to. that's my exciting moment right there. I, I'd like to talk again about how, well, tell everybody what was really happening here, because I didn't even set that up. Uh, what's going on with Ramon in this episode? Well, Ramon was a, he and his wife, she came into the country. They got married. They owned a, a very successful boxing gym. And after a while, their marriage went bad. So they were going to get a divorce. And he wanted to split everything 50-50, just like a lot of divorces do. Well, she didn't want that. She wanted everything. And they were doing very well. So there were a lot of assets, cars, houses, everything. And if she couldn't have everything, then she wanted him dead. So she set about looking for someone to uh, murder him. And fortunately, someone that's close to Ramon found out about it. So they set her up and uh, actually on the show notes for that episode, I have a video of when the police went to sort of interview her because Ramon had been quote unquote missing for a few days, but they actually had him in a safe house, but they went and they talked to her for a few minutes and then they arrested her and uh, they got all that on, on the police body cam. So she's now in prison and uh, he's kind of processing everything. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And I won't, I, I won't give it away. The, the ep- people should listen to the episode to hear exactly how they catch her and really kind of connect the rest of these dots. But did you just read about this story then in the paper or something and say, or online and say, Hey, Ramon, you want to come on? Actually, in this case, the person that helped save Ramon was one of his kind of boxing proteges, a young man that was in the gym. And he contacted me through Instagram because I post on Instagram every day and I'm always asking for people that follow me, you know, do you have any crazy stories? Let me hear what you got. Maybe you can be a guest on my podcast. So he contacted me, but then I ended, ended up doing the interview, not with him, but with uh, Ramon himself. With Ramon, that's so well. By the way, so I don't forget, wh- what is your Instagram account so people can follow you? What was that like? What was it? Well, duh, <laughs> that's, that's pretty easy. The bad news is we don't include this on our show notes page because nobody can know about this uh, after show. In fact, I was talking to somebody today who's been listening to our show for a year and a half. And I love it when this happens. She just discovered that there's a secret track on every show. <laughs> And it's so, she must, as soon as she hears the ending, just clicks and fast forwards to the next she, show or something on does. her player. Right. It's so great. Uh, <laughs> you're all over the place with the show, which is half of what I like it. It's, it's, uh, every time that you are on, 
It's something completely different. And so I'm going to play a clip from another episode. This is you talking to a, a gentleman named Dan. Can you describe the terrain? I understand you're starting at Hercules Inlet, which is by the coast, and the South Pole is more in the geographical center of Antarctica, and you are going from sea level to 9,300 feet. Can you just talk a little bit about that or what you what you expected that to be like? Yeah, and so um, Hercules Inlet, it's uh, on the Ron Ice Shelf, and so it's technically on the ocean, <laughs> but it's frozen. You know, when they dropped me off at uh, Hercules Inlet, I could look north and, you know, just a frozen ocean as far as I could see. So it's technically the coast, but there wasn't any water anywhere nearby. And so I'm starting at sea level. And the first thing you got to do is climb up. And and I know this from reading other people's blogs and and doing some research. The first thing you got to do is climb up from sea level up into the mountains, basically, into the interior of Antarctica. So it's a pretty big climb to start with. And the thing that uh, made it even more difficult is it was pretty soft snow. And so that first climb up was so difficult. It's, it, I bet you I can't even na- imagine how difficult it was anymore because it's been too long. <laughs> but it was more difficult than anybody could possibly imagine. And I know I'm thinking was- I'm thinking, Scott, that a lot of people sitting here are thinking, OK, well, Dan is uh, hiking uh, to the South Pole. But, oh, Dan, mm-hmm. he ain't hiking. <laughs> no, he's a bike rider. How, how, <laughs> how, how does a guy decide to ride his bike to the South Pole? He heard about it somewhere and nobody had done it, actually. So he wanted to be the first one to do it. And he spent a ton of money on this because the logistics involved, you know, you fly to Chile and then from Chile, there's a company that specializes in this. They fly him over to Antarctica and he starts. The, the weird thing is, the thing I knew that I learned in this is that The South Pole elevation is 9,300 feet. 300 of that is land. The other 9,000 feet, almost two miles, is ice. So it's ice, two miles thick. He actually, when he was doing this, he walked over the top of mountains, but he didn't even see them because they're all under ice. That's so incredible. And how much time did it take him to plan this thing? Probably over a year. I'm not sure how long it took him to plan it. He owned a bike shop. And one of his customers kept coming in and saying, hey, one day if we win the lottery, I'm gonna, we're going to go down and bike to the South Pole. Well, the other guy didn't do it, but he decided to, <laughs> Dan decided he wanted to do it. And it took him 51 days out there all by himself, just biking day after, like 13 hours a day at temperatures of like 40 below zero. It's phenomenal how he does it. And I was riveted mm-hmm. my entire, well, it actually made it through two runs with me. <laughs> I ran three mm-hmm. miles twice and uh, mm-hmm. it took me that to get through it. And it was fantastic. You're all over the place. What's your favorite personal episode so far in the series? I have to tell you, my favorite episode is still episode one. The very first one, you know, usually you, when you do a podcast, you look back at episode one, you're kind of embarrassed because you weren't really good then. And, but, oh, this was just, I, I I just, I was very lucky with the guest that I got. It was Jennifer and she's a young mother from Texas who accidentally killed someone. She caused a, a fatal accident, a car accident. She was with her two young children at the time and she pulled out at night and didn't see the motorcycle approaching from the left and Um, And he ended up dying two days later. Oh, no. And it helps because she's a really good storyteller, very emotional. You you know, when the guest breaks into tears two or three times during the story, it's going to be a a, a good story. It's just riveting. I was going to ask you, how do you feel as a podcaster just hearing that? Because you're, you know, you're front and center. What did it feel like to be sitting there front and center with her? She's telling you this horrible story. Well, you know, one of the big things that I really like about podcasts that I listen to are when it can generate some kind of a strong emotion. And whether that's, you know, making the listener cry, either out of sadness or happiness, or laugh, or make you really think or empathize with what that person was going through, dude, that's my goal for each show. If I can generate some kind of a strong emotion like that, and boy, that one did. Boy, absolutely. The show again is what was that like? How do people, if somebody thinks they have uh, an idea for your show, how do they submit that to you? 
Well, they can contact me by email if they want, just scott at whatwasthatlike.com or uh, on the website, whatwasthatlike.com. I've got a submission form, a contact form. They can do that. But I have to tell you, though, one thing that I've learned from after doing this for almost a year now is that a lot of people will send me an idea and it's something that they think, and, and it's certainly a traumatic experience for them possibly, but it's just not yeah. what I would consider to be a really – uh, not to, to be unusual enough for the show. I, you know, I had someone that say, I, I got to tell you about this. My one time I fell down the stairs and I hit my head. I had to go to the emergency room. Oh, it was crazy. Well, okay. No, nobody's going to look at that on their podcast saying, you know, Susan fell down the stairs and they're going to say, wow, I really have to listen to that story because it's just too, it's too common. So I have a really high standard for what I consider to be unusual stories. And there are three types of stories that I don't do. One is anything related to the paranormal, because there's lots of other podcasts that do that. And I verify all my stories as true, and really paranormal, you can't really verify anything. Uh, the second thing is medically related. So if you've got a, if you, you know, you had some rare disease that you weren't supposed to survive and you got through it anyway, I don't really do that. And the other thing is any stories where the primary topic is drugs or sex, because Everybody has those stories and they're not unusual. Just, just, just not your stuff. So, so yeah. well, I do have a cool story that I'll tell you as soon as we get done here, Scott, about the time my brother okay. beat me at risk. And I know that's going to be big for you. So I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Scott Johnson. Thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes. Thanks, Joe. I love the basement. Thanks.